Amen. So Philippians chapter 1, I want to look there, beginning at verse 8, where it says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this really isn't part of my message, but, you know, even when, you know, I'll, I'll read these passages and I'll have something in mind I'm going to preach, and then you get up and you hear the preaching or you hear the, the it being read and so many other thoughts come to your mind. And, boy, we could have preached a whole other sermon about, you know, how much Paul loved these people. You know, not just the Philippians, but all people. And, of course, Paul, you know, he, he did a lot of face ripping, too. He was a very hard preacher. And he, he talked very sternly. But you can never deny the fact that, you know, Paul, at the end of the day, loved the people that he was preaching to and the people that he cared about. But, uh, and he goes on in verse 9, and of course, I'm not preaching about that this morning. I was just thinking about that uh, as, he was, as Brother Garza was reading. And it says in verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more, in knowledge and in all judgment. You know, and then again, there's another sermon right there about how Paul is praying that we would abound in what? In all judgment. You know, which would seem to go contrary to so many, uh, so much philosophy that's out there today in Christianity about, you know, judging not in the world who would say, you know, you shouldn't judge. But here's Paul praying that we would judge. And that in fact, we would abound in all judgment. So again, there's so many great uh, sermons just in this few verses here. And in fact, Philippians chapter 1 is a very famous passage and a lot of great sermons have been preached, but the part I want to focus on there is in verse 10, where it says, that you may prove the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus unto the glory and praise of God. So he says there that he wants them to be sincere. And of course, what does the word sincere mean? It means to be free from pretense or deceit, proceeding from genuine feelings. That's what Paul's saying here. He wants them to prove the things that are excellent and that they would be sincere, that they would the things that they say and do and their service to Christ would be real, that it would proceed from uh, a, a, a genuine feelings, right? That it wouldn't be pretentious, that it wouldn't be deceitful, that they wouldn't be putting themselves out there as something that they indeed are not. And notice here how sincerity is associated with truth. And if you'll uh, pay attention throughout the sermon, when we look at several different passages, you'll see that again, how often sincerity and truth are mentioned in the same breath. He says in verse 12, But I would have you understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places, and many of the brethren of the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. So now he's starting to, to contrast two groups of people. Those that would preach Christ of envy and strife, and those that would preach him also of goodwill. He continues with that contrast in verse 16. He says, The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, uh, whether in pretense, right? That was the one group, the pretense, those that were preaching it not sincerely, those that were preaching it, you know, at, hoping to, supposing to add affliction to his bonds, those that would preach uh, whether in pretense or in what? Or in truth. Christ is preached. So you see here, that to be sincere or to be not sincere is to be pretentious, to be in pretense. Those that would preach Christ not sincerely are preaching in what? In pretense. And what is pretense? It is an attempt to make something that is not the case appear true. Right? Basically, it's being fake. It's not being genuine. It's a false display of feelings. It's a false display of attitudes or intentions. It's making yourself out to be something that you're not or presenting a situation as something that it's not. It's being pretentious. An insincere person is a pretentious person. That's what we see here. That they're not preaching Christ sincerely, but in pretense. And it says, uh, you, know, you know, that they, this would make them an, uh, an insincere person as a, as a pretentious person. Pretentious, attempting to oppress or by affecting greater importance, talent than is actually possessed. Okay? So that's what Paul is saying here this morning, that he wants the Philippians to be sincere. And not to just, you know, uh, you know, in the sense that they're not fake, in the sense that they're not just putting on a show, but that what they're doing is coming from a place of genuine care and emotion and feeling, that they actually think, care about the things of Christ, that that's where uh, their service towards God is coming from, from a place of sincerity. 
And really that, you know, Paul was the leader here in Philippians, or he was, you know, he wasn't the pastor there or anything like that, but he was definitely, you know, he was the one that had bought, begotten them again in, in Christ. He was the one that had preached the gospel to them when he went out on his missionary journeys and, and got people saved and brought that church together. And this was his desire for them, you know, and he wanted them to have a sincere, honest, and real walk with God. You know, and that's the desire of every, you know, uh, preacher, every spiritual leader, every, you know, pastor, deacon, whatever it is, anybody that's overseeing a flock, their desire, if they're sincere, is that the people that they're preaching to and overseeing, would they themselves have an honest and real walk with God? Not just show up, you know, and, and look the part and play the part and, and say the right things on Sunday, say the right things at the midweek service, do the soul winning, but the other times when people are not watching, when the preacher isn't there, when the other uh, brother and brethren and sister are not around, that those people would still have a very real walk with God, day in, day out, serving the Lord with sincerity. And that's the title of the sermon this morning, Serve God with Sincerity. You know, that ought to be a desire in our life that we serve God sincerely, you know, out of a place of genuine feeling that we desire, that we love God, that we're going to serve Him no matter what. That we're going to serve God because we want to, not just because we feel like we should. Now, if you would, go over, keep something in Philippians, but go over to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. <clears throat> and in Joshua chapter 14, we'll find, of course, a very familiar passage where it begins reading in verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye uh, this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods of your fathers uh, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Then, of course, the last part there is the one that everybody paints on their wall at their house. You know, this is the one you can get the Hallmark card, or you can get go to the get the decorative picture, and that's fine and good. It says, "But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." Very famous passage, right? But back up, verse fourteen. Now, why was Joshua able to say that? That he was going to you know, uh, serve God and that it didn't matter what anybody else did. He said, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And what was he imploring these people to do? When he's saying, look, put away the gods of the Amorites, serve the Lord like I'm going to do. He says in verse 14, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in what? In sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood in, in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. So he's telling them to put away these false gods. Now, it's kind of strange that he has to tell them that because you would think, I mean, these are the people that came over into the land, helped conquer the land of Canaan. They'd done all these great, mighty works through the power of God. In fact, I believe if you even asked these people at that time, hey, do you, do you love the Lord? They'd say, yeah. But at the same time, they have these other false gods. They have these other, you know, they, they've just kind of added the Lord to all these other gods. And he's saying here, look, if you're going to serve God in sincerity and in truth, if you're going to serve God sincerely in your life, you need to put away these other things. You need to get away, you need to put away the gods which your father served. You know, we as Christians, we have to keep that in mind too, especially those of us, you know, that maybe are come, have been saved later in life and are coming into life uh, out of, you know, a life of worldliness, a life of sin or whatever it is. You know, we need to learn to put away those things that we used to, you know, uh, allow ourselves to enjoy or do or whatever it is. The ungodly things, the ungodly habits, the sins, whatever it is, the old baggage that kind of hangs on that we don't want to quite get rid of. It's like there has to come a point in your life where you put that away once and for all. And you're done with it and you move on. Why? Because you're serving God sincerely and in truth. We're not just going to add Jesus, you know, to a wicked life. <laughs> so serving God, and if you would, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Serving God with sincerity, you know, means putting away that which is sinful. I mean, that's what Joshua was saying there. Look, serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served. If you're going to be sincere, if you're going to be real, you're going to have to put away these other gods. And you're going to have to decide that you're going to serve the Lord and him alone. <clears throat> and this is a principle that's taught throughout Scripture. You'll look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 21, it says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. <clears throat> you cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. And that just makes sense, doesn't it? 
Now, we don't often really think about that in, in these terms, right? We would say, well, yeah, I'm serving the Lord, and, and I know He doesn't approve of, of this or that in my life, or this sin or that sin, or maybe I need to quit doing this or quit associating with, you know, whatever it is that you know that the Lord disapproves of. We don't think about it in those terms. It's the devil's table. And maybe if we did start to think about it more like that, Maybe if the people in Joshua's day would start to think about the gods that they served as, you know, wicked, evil devils, they would be more prone to get rid of those things in their life. Maybe if we let sin become more exceedingly sinful unto us, we would start to say, you know what, I don't want this. I'd rather serve God sincerely than to try to, 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 to live one foot in the world and one foot with the Lord. That's an unbalanced walk. You know, people, you know, try to live the Christian life that way. You know, they want to serve God Sunday, they want to serve God in the midweek, but the rest of the week, you know, they just, they don't want to read the Bible. They don't want to listen to the preaching. They don't want to think about the things of God. They want to think about the things of the world or whatever, get involved in sin. And what they have is they have one foot walking with God and one foot in the world. And they wonder why they walk funny. And people look around and go, man, you're walking funny. Why is that? Because you're trying to drink the cup of devils and the, cup of the Lord, and the cup of the Lord. You're trying to eat at two different tables. You're trying to serve two masters and it doesn't work. You know, people that have one foot in the world and one foot uh, you know, with the Lord, they stumble and fall. You know, because they're unbalanced in life. <clears throat> so we see here that to serve God sincerely, we're going to have to put away that which is sinful. Put away that which is false. Put away that which, the God, which God would disapprove of in our life. <clears throat> and some things, you know, are not all things, now not all things are inherently sinful, are they? And some things that we get involved with that maybe they're just taking too much of our time, maybe that's just, you know, too much of our affection, those things are not inherently sinful. But they still need to be purged nonetheless. And here's the thing, and this is kind of what I want us to understand this morning is that and I, I know I've alluded to this even recently, is that God's not just going to stand passively by if we fail to do this in our life. God's not just going to, you know, suck his thumb and, and boo-hoo about it and be disappointed. God is a God that actively works to bring his children around. And I'm glad he does. I'm glad God doesn't just let us go on our merry way, stumbling and falling through life, that he, that he works in our lives, that he corrects us, that he tries to bring us back. Why? So that we can walk a nice straight line and not fall over all the time. Now look here, in, uh, for where you are in 1 Corinthians chapter 21, he said, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. In verse 22, he says this, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Look, that's a warning that if you continue to have these two tables that you eat at in your life, if you're going to continue keep harboring some sin, or some, whatever it is. Maybe it's not even something sinful. Maybe it's just something that's robbing your time that God, that, that, that God needs, that God deserves. That God's not just going to, you know, say, oh, well, I guess that's just the way it is. God's going to get jealous. I mean, we read, you know, recently where he said, I am a jealous God. My name is Jealous. That's just what he calls himself. You know, God's going to get jealous for his children. God's going to get jealous over those things that, you know, are taking the place of him in your life. You know, we get up, and, and Bible reading is probably one of the most basic, just simple examples. You know, we get up in the morning, and we, before we even start our day, you know, we're, we should be getting in this book and seeing what God wants to tell us. God wants to speak to us today. Can we give God some time before we get so busy in our day? And then the day's over, and we're tired, and we just want to go to bed, and we haven't given a moment to the Lord. You know, but what do we do in the morning? Are we getting up and reading it? Or is the first thing we're doing, you know, checking social media? Got to see what happened on Facebook overnight. Nothing happened. Everybody else was asleep. You know, I know we're, in a far, we're farther west and there's been more time in the day, in the morning, for people to get on Facebook and put new posts up there. You know, but it's only a few hours, right? <clears throat> and God's just going to get jealous. You know, and that's just, that's a very mild example. And we could talk about a lot of other things, but... And some of these things that are not inherently sinful, but they, become, be, they begin to compete for our time and attention. And God says, I want that time. I want that attention. <clears throat> I mean, in Joshua's day, it was literal idols, right? They had these false gods. 
I mean, little statues and stuff like that. And he's saying, look, you've got to put that away. If you're going to serve God sincerely and in truth, and not just with lip service, then you're going to have to put that away and get real with God. <clears throat> and in Joshua's day, it was literal idols, but today, in the U.S. anyway, and in many places of the world, it would still be literal idols, by the way. And even in some, you know, in some uh, circumstances, it would be that here too. You know, when we get to start talking about the different religions that use idols and, 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 and things like that. But I think primarily today, most people, you know, idolatry in the sense of, you know, bowing down to a statue isn't a big, isn't a problem for them. Although it is out there. But today, maybe that's more, comes, up, falls, comes in, the shape, in the form of covetousness. You know, maybe it's covetousness in our life that, you know, is robbing our time with God is taking the place of the Lord in life. Maybe that's the cup of devils that we're drinking from. Maybe that's the table of devils that we're eating at, is covetousness in our life. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You're there in, ver in chapter 10. Just go back a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He said in Colossians 3, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. He's saying, look, mortify your members which are upon the earth. What does it mean to mortify it? Kill it. Kill your members on the earth. Don't be, you know, don't let your, your, your body just, and every impulse, and every, you know, just don't gratify every impulse of the flesh, is what he's saying. Fornication, uncleanness, all these things. Evil concupiscence. And he says covetousness, which is idolatry. You know, we should not let money take place of God in our life. You cannot serve the cup of, you cannot drink of, of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord table and, of, and the tub, table of devils. What did Jesus say? You cannot serve God and what? Mammon, which is money. <clears throat> and if we're going to get sincere, if we're going to serve God sincerely, and this is just one example. You know, it would take, all morning to sit here and go through every possible thing that could creep into your life and keep you from serving God sincerely. This is just one example with, with covetousness. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For Christ our Passover is sacrificed uh, for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Look, we've got to purge the sin in our life and get it out of our life. And it's a process, and I'm not saying we're going to reach some kind of state of sinless perfection, but we have to constantly be working in our life to get those things which God uh, disapproves of or which displeases Him, those things that are robbing our time and attention, those things that are preventing us from serving God sincerely, we need to get those out of our life so that we can serve God with sincerity and truth. And if we fail to do this, like I talked about earlier, God is going to get jealous. He's not just, and we need to, we need to get this through our heads, that God isn't just passive about this. That God, like any loving father, is going to correct his children and bring them around. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, to bring this into just real basic terms is that failing to put away sin is going to lead to a spanking. Right? Now, of course, you know, a man's hand is not going to appear like in Daniel's day and give you, you know, instead of the writing on the wall, he's got a paddle in his hand. Right? And we know that. But I'm saying in life, God has other ways of, you know, chastening his children. <clears throat> you know, things won't work out. You know, jobs will get difficult. Relationships will suffer. Finances suffer. You know, maybe that thing that we're so obsessed with about, you know, it's, gonna, it's taking away, us away from the Lord, that's what God's probably going to mess with. You know, we're spending so much time on the Internet, we can't read our Bible. And then God just pulls a plug on the Internet. I don't know. Whatever it might be. But God's going to do something in our life to you know, give us a spiritual spanking. He's going to chasten his children. <clears throat> so why don't we just you know, beat God to the punch this morning? Why don't we just go ahead and say, you know what, God, you, I, I see what, what it is in my life. And look, no one in this room is perfect, self-included. 
We all have to step back and examine ourselves and say, what is it in my life that's preventing me from serving the Lord the way I should with sincerity and truth? Is there something there? Is there something in the way? And if there is, we need to get rid of it. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Look, if we would just take the time in our Christian life to just take stock, take inventory of where we are spiritually and just be brutally honest with ourselves and say, I'm coming up short here. I'm failing here. I've got to get this sin out of my life. Whatever it is, and we just went ahead and do that, then God could just say, oh, no, I don't have to take care of that for you. You know, and maybe spare ourselves some, some heartache and some suffering. <clears throat> so we see that if we're going to serve God sincerely this morning, we're going to have to put away that which is sinful. You know, we're going to have to purge out the leaven that's in our life. And if we're going to serve the Lord with sincerity this morning, you need to learn to do that simply. Do it simply. Do it, you know, genuinely. Do it the way God wants things done. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <coughs> You know, God has a way that He wants to be served. God has a way that He wants us to serve Him. And he, it's not just this open-ended book where He just says, serve me however you see fit. And this is important to understand because people have a lot of ideas in their mind about what it means to serve God. And in fact, there's a lot of people out there that are doing things thinking, this is me serving God, that isn't them serving God at all. Because they're not doing it the way God wants to do it. We need to learn to serve God the way he wants to be served. Serve him simply. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Verse 12, it reads, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. Were. He's saying his conversation in the world was done in simplicity and godly sincerity. So we need to, and it was not with fleshly wisdom. Was as he's saying, look, our testimony of our conscience uh, that they, you know, they weren't, uh, you know, serving God the, the way the world would have them to serve God. They were serving God the way He wanted them to serve them. And the fleshly wisdom, you know, that's often, you know, the world has a lot of ideas about there's a better way to serve God. You know, and even churches, we start to people can start to think of ways of saying, well. I know that God told us to do, th do things this way, and if you would, go over to Acts chapter 20, but wouldn't it be better if we did it this way? And maybe humanly speaking, it might even sound, well, that, that sounds better if we did things differently. Why do we have to do things the way we do things? Because that's the way God wants them done. <clears throat> that's what the, the fleshly wisdom suggests, that there's a better way to serve God other than the way which He has prescribed. And if you're going to serve God simply, if you're going to serve God with sincerity this morning, you're going to serve God the way He wants to be served. And not make up some new way and call it me serving God. <clears throat> you're going to Acts chapter 20, look at Act, uh, Mark chapter 6. You know, the, the example of soul winning is one that's going to come up often in this church. And it's going to, and it's going to stay that way. <laughs> You know, I sometimes I, I, you know, as a preacher, I don't always, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but when it comes to soul winning, I want to sound like a broken record. Amen. You know, there's a reason why that van fills up with, you know, 10 plus people every Sunday afternoon and goes out soul winning. It's because there's a preacher that gets up and preaches about soul winning. The reason why that map is getting turned red, the reason why souls are getting saved is because soul winning is a theme here. And it's something I'm going to preach about and preach about and preach about, even at the risk of of sounding like a broken record. Because I want to create a culture of soul winning in this church. And praise God, it's there. We have it. Let's not lose it, okay? And here's the thing. Soul winning is, the pri I believe, the primary way that we serve God. It is, 100%. I mean, that's what Jesus preached. That was his example. That's what he did. That's what, that was his last commandment when he ascended into heaven. You know, when, when he's, he's literally just floating away from them. You know, Go ye into all the world. He's just, you know, slowly starting to rise. If I did that this morning, everybody would wake right up. You know, if I was like up against the ceiling just <laughs> preaching my sermon, going through the tile, you'd all run out in the parking lot. What's he going to say next? 
I mean, I, and I could say anything. You know, I could read a, you know, a recipe for, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, ragu or something. I don't know. I'm not a cook. But I could say it. But I'd have your attention, wouldn't I? And when Jesus is ascending into heaven, what does he say? Serve me however you see fit. Honor me in whatever way is most convenient for you. Is that what he said? He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And behold, I am with you even at the end of the world. That's what he said as he would that made that dramatic exit. That was his last command to his disciples. And that was, you know, that was, he didn't just come up with that then. Oh, oh, I forgot one last thing. You know, uh, preach the gospel. No, he was preaching that and doing that and commanding that his entire ministry. <laughs> so that's why it's a big theme here because it was a big theme with the Lord. And if we're going to serve God sincerely today, we're going to be soul winners. And we have to start somewhere. You know, even if it says a silent partner, whatever. And it says in verse 7, and he called unto him the twelve. Or oh, you're in Acts 20. I'm reading from Mark 6. He called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. So when he's sending out the disciples, he sends them out two by two. You ever wonder why we do that? Because that's how God wanted, wanted it done. I mean, couldn't we get more done if everybody went out by themselves? Yeah. In fact, it would be twice as much, right? We would double our efforts. Hey, I'm going to give everybody that shows up for soul winning this afternoon, everyone, every person's going to get their own individual map. And they're going to, and they're going to do all of it their, themselves. We're not going to do partners anymore. No, um, we're not going to do that because this is the model that God wants it done. You know, he wants us to go out two by two. Even, even the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses figured this out. They don't even have the Holy Spirit. They're not even saved, but they could figure out, oh, you go two by two. And there's a whole list of reasons why, you know, why that makes good sense. I don't think God just pulled out a number out of a hat. How many should I send them out by? Eh, two sounds good. You know, because you have the fellowship, you have the encouragement, you have the accountability, you have the safety, all these things, right? But that's the way God wanted it done, to be sent out two by two. <clears throat> now look there in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, of course, this is Paul as he's beginning to give his parting words. He called the elders of the church and he went, and then when they came to him, he said to them, You know, uh, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility, humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and taught you publicly. Now, are we doing that? Teaching publicly? Yeah, that's going on right now. That's why we do what we do. That's why we have preaching. Because we're doing things like Paul did, like God had him do. Like Jesus did. Did Jesus teach publicly? All the time. This isn't, you know, an exclusive club, you know. You know, th that was just the tithe this morning. That wasn't membership dues that people were putting in there. You know, you don't have to put anything in the plate to come here. Right? This is, there's, no one here has a card that says faithful word. We don't, we're not checking you at the door to see, oh, I don't see you on the list. You know, this is open to the public. People can walk in and, and sit down and listen and be taught publicly like Paul did, like Jesus did. That's the pattern of service that we see there. That's the way God wanted things done. And he goes on and says, and from house to house. That's what we're going to do this afternoon. And that's the way God wants to be served. And the point I'm trying to make is that if we're going to serve God this morning, we're going to do it simply. Meaning we're going to do it the way God wants it done. Doesn't that sound pretty simple? I mean, this is a pretty simple way to serve God. Let's just get some chairs. We'll get a pulpit. We'll open up the book. We'll put some guy behind the pulpit that you know, meets the qualifications and he can rant and rave and yell and scream and froth and spit and do everything he needs to do to get us to go do what we need to do. That sounds pretty simple. Now, I've been thinking about this a lot, this phrase, you know, that, that God has you know, chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. You think about how foolish this, the world looks at, at us and so that's foolish. You say, yeah, that's what God wanted. He wanted the foolishness of preaching for me to just get up and read, the, read this book and, and just say something about it. And we would say, how does that do, how is that serving God? I, I don't know, but he, that's how he wants it done. And he gets all the glory for it. 
<laughs> Doesn't it sound simple to just gather here and, and have the preaching of the word, teach public? It sounds pretty simple that we're just going to go out two by two this morning and just go knock doors house to house and ask people if we can show them how to be saved. That's simple. But the world, the fleshly wisdom, they don't want to serve God sincerely. They don't want to serve God in, sim in simplicity and, sim and, and sincerely. They don't want to serve Him like that. They want to come up with some new way, some better way of serving God. You know, and even, you know, well-intentioned churches, they come up all kinds of different ways besides what God has prescribed. And I'm telling you, it's insincere. It's insincere that it's not what God, the way, because it's not what God wants. Because they're not serving, they're not looking to serve God the way he wants to be served. They're looking to serve God as, uh, as they see fit, as suits them, as is convenient for them. <coughs> and we could talk about all the different ways, you know, and probably... One would be, you know, people that just want to hand out invites to church. Not even knock the door. We're just going to put a door hanger on and then run away. Look, we hand out invites. You know, while we're there, we might as well leave an invite. You know, people come out because of invites. <laughs> but that's not how God wants us to serve. He wants us to go door to door, knocking the door, and, and teaching publicly and from house to house. Look, it would have done me no good yesterday to be out there for all those hours that we were driving up and down that mountain, over the river and through the woods, as it were, you know, knocking those doors and inviting people to a church that was six hours away. You know, what, that would have made no sense. Hey, we're just handing out invites. You know, let me just leave this in their gate and get out of here. No, that, we need to preach to them. We need to open up the Bible. We need to tell them, look, God wants you to be saved and, and preach them the gospel. And that's how God wants to be served this morning. And it's simple, isn't it? And if we're sincere, that's how we're going to do it. We're not going to come up with some newfangled way of trying to serve God. We're going to do it the way he prescribed. He said, go over to, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, in Luke chapter 14, the Lord said to the servant, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Now his house is heaven. Right? He wants us to go out into the highways and hedges. Go find people wherever they are and compel them to come into God's house to be saved. That's what God wants this morning. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 12. <clears throat> he said, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. Now I love that he says there, you know, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. <clears throat> that they, what was the testimony of their conscience? That in simplicity and godly, sincer and godly sincerity they had had their conversation in the world. That they had lived their life simply doing things the way God wants them done in godly sincerity. They were serving God in truth. <clears throat> And then because of that, you know, that was the testimony of their conscience. You know, if you serve God simply and sincerely, it's going to help you sleep at night. <laughs> it's not going to keep you up going, oh boy, I know I'm doing all these things all day that God doesn't want me to do. I know I'm completely backslidden. And then you wonder why you're tossing and turning and you wonder why you're always under conviction or why we're always depressed or why, you know, things don't seem to be going right or why we're always in a bad mood. It's because your conscience is bothering you. Because you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're quenching the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what sin does in our life. It quenches the Holy Spirit. It grieves Him. And God starts to work and, and maybe, you know, maybe we have a long, restless night. <laughs> but He's saying here, look, the testimony of our conscience. You know, we did things right. We served Him simply. We did it in godly sincerity. That was our conversation. You know, we're not going to have to worry about whether or not God is pleased with this church if we're doing things the way God wants them done. Because, God, you know, people would look in here and, and walk in and say, this church, is, this church is a failure. This is all the bigger your building is? You only have this many people? You guys aren't, you're not succeeding. We're, you got to get into the stadium. You know, you got to get the mega church. That's, that's success, brother, right there. Joel Osteen, that's success. You know, when you're, when you're you know, running out entire stadiums, when you just have a mega church, thousands of people, that is success. Is that how God measures success, just by numbers? Is that hard to do, just get a big crowd? People do it all the time. 
False prophets do it all the time. There's churches all across this city that are just filled to the brim. Hundreds and hundreds of people. But here's a question I have for them. Are they serving God in sincerity this morning? Are they doing things God uh, the way God wants them done? Is that preacher getting up and preaching the whole counsel of God? Is he sincerely, uh, you know, is he, is he doing like Paul did and, and preaching them everything and holding nothing back? Because if you start to hold nothing back as a preacher, people aren't going to stick around. They're going to say, whoa. <laughs> this church actually expects me to serve God? Well, I don't know about that. I just came here to, you know, get my ears rubbed. I just had a scratch that I needed itched. And if you're not willing to do that, then I'm going to go find somebody that is. And they're out there. I mean, you could just put a blindfold on and start walking and you'll run into one. They're everywhere. <clears throat> but here, here's the thing. I look at this and I say, and I say, I know God looks down at this church and says, that church is a success. Not because of the number of people that are in the room, but because of what these people are doing. Because people are going out and knocking doors. Because the word of God is being preached. Because souls are being saved. I'm not tossing and turning tonight wondering if, if, if FWB Tucson is pleasing to God or not. I know it is. Because it's serving God in simplicity and truth. You know, and it doesn't matter if the world acknowledges us. It doesn't matter if we reach some level of fame. You know, if we're doing what God wants us to do, we're success. And that leads to our rejoicing. That's what he said there. For our rejoicing is this. You know, Paul wasn't just going, well, I'm serving God sin sincerely. Well, at least I'm serving God sincerely. <sighs> I'm going soul winning. Well, at least I'm preaching all the word. Like it was some drudgery to him. I mean, I don't know about you. You read Paul's life and you think, wow, that's an exciting life. That's really something. You think Paul was dragging his feet through life just trying to get through another day? No way. I mean, I'm sure he had his ups and downs, but... That was some life he lived. And what was he doing? He was serving God with simplicity and sincerely. You know, if we serve God simply, you're going to have a song in your heart. You know, you're going you're gonna to go out and serve God and you don't have to worry whether or not God is pleased with the results. And this is something I want to talk about because I hear a lot of people say this. You know, we'll go out soul winning. I, I'm a, you know, and it's not just here. I, I have other soul winning times in Phoenix and I, I take people soul winning and now, it's part of the job to run these soul winning times and make that available to different people. So I go out a lot with a lot of different people. But I've noticed I, I, I tend to hear this more often than, than I... And I'm not faulting people that say it. I understand where they're coming from. But they need to understand something. And I also often say something to them you know, when, when they say this. But they'll, they'll get in and, and we'll be in a hard neighborhood and no one gets saved. You know, we're out there for an hour, two hours. Nobody gets saved. Everyone gets back in the van. And, and, and sometimes someone will just be like man, nobody. And they'll just have some kind of an expression of just like, man, what a, we didn't even get anybody saved or, you know, what a tough neighborhood. And you can tell they're just kind of down. Now look, I love seeing people get saved. I really do. And of course that lifts our spirits and we rejoice over that. But I can rejoice as just as much as if we go out soul winning for hours and nobody gets saved. Why? Because I'm serving God in simplicity and sincerity. Because I'm doing what God wants me to do. And this is what I often tell people that express that, uh, that sentiment. That their disappointment that, uh, that people haven't gotten saved. And of course that's disappointing, but I'm saying don't let it drag you down and rob you of your joy. It's like, then, they, because then soul winning will become a drudgery. Then it will become like, oh, I've got to drag myself through this neighborhood. And just get through this. <clears throat> you know, God, God is, is pleased with us going. And this is what I'll say. I say, well, you know, the command is to go into all the world, not save the whole world. And the, God, the, the command is to go and preach. And if we've done that, then we're a success. Look, if we go out this afternoon and knock doors for, you know, a few hours, a couple hours, you guys are like, phew, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Did you, have you looked at the temperature lately? Right? If we go out there and we do our duty, we knock these doors and nobody gets saved, we can still come back here with, with a smile on our face, a song in our heart, because of the fact that we know we obeyed God and that we went out and served God with simplicity and sincerity this morning. Because <clears throat> here here's the thing. You know, serving God, let's just review real quick, of course, you know, means putting away that which is sinful in your life. If you're going to be real with God, get real with God, get the sin out, 
do those things which are pleasing to him. You know, and serving God means serving him simply. Do things the way God wants them done. Don't try to come up with some newfangled way. And don't get discouraged with, with the results or lack thereof. If you're doing things the way God wants them done, you'll, you're a success. Whether this church runs, runs 100 or not, we're a success. Because we're doing things the way God wants them done. <laughs> but here's the other thing. Serving the Lord with sincerity means not caring who sees us. It doesn't matter if we're recognized or not. It doesn't matter who sees us, whether or not somebody, oh, good job down there, faithful word, Tucson. It doesn't matter. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Somebody who's serving God sincerely with the right reasons doesn't care whether anybody else notices. Doesn't care whether or not somebody else is going to, you know, laud their praise. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we Christ. You know, when you go out and you speak, uh, you know, when you're, when you're speaking Christ to somebody, when you're preaching the gospel, you know, you're doing that in the sight of God. <clears throat> and you don't need anybody else to see besides God. If you're serving God sincerely. If you're really serving God with sincerity, you'll go out there and understand that when you're serving Him, you're serving Him in His sight. And the only person you're worried about impressing is Him. Because <clears throat> here's the thing, insincere people, <clears throat> they serve to be seen of men. Go over to Matthew chapter 23. People who don't, they, they, they'll say, oh, I love God, I love the Lord, I love serving God, it's, it's, I just love it, love it, love it, love it. <clears throat> but they'll, they, only, they only do it to be seen of people. That's an insincerity. Because <clears throat> will those same people be serving God if nobody was looking? No. And there's a specific group that Jesus addressed called the Pharisees. And that was their problem. They were not sincere people. <clears throat> they loved to be seen. Look at Matthew 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works. He says, don't be like them. For they say and do not. They were hypocrites. They were insincere. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move, one of them, one, one, uh, will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works, all their works, he's saying everything they do, all their works they do for to be seen of men. Look, they're, they're sitting in Moses' seat and they're telling people to do the right things. They're saying, hey, do this, do that. But the, where their motivation, anything that they did, they would not do except to be seen of men. <clears throat> You know, and we could talk about, you know, the way this, this could manifest in our life. You know, the, 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 the soul winning. You know, and this is something as, as a preacher that I have to be on guard about too. You know, here's the thing. My preaching would be insincere if all I cared about was being acknowledged. By, beside, by, you know, besides by those that weren't present. If all I cared about was people who weren't even in this room acknowledging me, if I was just up here preaching so that I can press somebody on the internet, my preaching would be insincere. Because that's, then those would be the people that I care about. Those would be the people that I, I'm, I'm concerned with. That wouldn't be genuine. That would be insincere. But because I am concerned about the people in this room more than anybody else, you know, my preaching is sincere. At least I feel like it is. <laughs> I mean, you think it, what makes more, what do you think matters more to me as a preacher? That I get 100 views on YouTube or that one person in this room hears one thing in one sermon that maybe just changes their life a little bit and makes them a better Christian? What's going to last longer for me as a reward for a preacher? The fact that, you know, somebody, you know, acknowledges, you know, leaves a comment or shares my video, whatever, that I get some online acknowledgement, you know, that's a fleeting reward. That's, that's it's nothing. Or maybe one person Here's something that I preach out of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit comes and it makes a change in their life and that person, I don't know, becomes a soul winner. And because of something that was said in some service down here that I preached, 
Somebody's life is changed and many more souls are saved. I mean, that's what matters. <clears throat> What's more, you know, what, 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 what would be, uh, what would make your soul winning insincere? You know, are you out there soul winning just so you can get the pose for Instagram? Like, oh, give me, yeah, wait, wait, let me get in the right light here. Okay, oh, wait. Okay, give me, like, candy, like, I'm, I'm knocking on the door. I've already got my Bible open. Because I'm such a good soul winner, I already know they're going to want to hear everything and say, just, you know, get your, get your Instagram pose out soul winning. Look, people, people do this, and I, sometimes I think people don't realize, really, that it's kind of going on. You know, maybe it's not to the degree, obviously, I'm making fun. But I see, and sometimes when people are taking pictures of themselves, just constantly posting pictures of themselves soul winning, I'm just like, why are you, why are you doing that? Are, are, I mean, now look, I've posted pictures of people soul winning, but they never know I took that picture. And I'm posting it, you know, to try to show that, hey, we're a soul winning church, or, you know, it's for a yearbook, it's a memory, it's a, it's a trip that we went on, or something like that. And people appreciate that. But I'm not, I'm not like, hey, hold still. All right, can you move a little left, you know? Uh, you know, you know, the lighting isn't right. Let me get a filter. Let me get the right filter here. I want to make you look extra good. <laughs> and sometimes you see people, it's like, are you soul winning just to just show people you go soul winning? Are we soul winning just to be seen of men? Am I preaching these sermons just to be heard on the internet? Or are we sincere? Are we actually keep the people that, do, excuse me, we actually care about the people that we're going to make real authentic eye contact with. Or do we actually care about people that we're going to see in the flesh and blood that we're going to open our mouth and speak the word of God to? If that's the case, then we can step back and say, well, we're sincere in what we're doing. Now we're serving God sincerely in simplicity. <clears throat> you know, insincere people, they go out of their way to be seen of men. That's what it says there in Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. They says, all their works they do to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge their borders of their garments. <laughs> I mean, they're taking the time to, you know, sit down with needle and thread like, well, this border's not big enough. No one's going to notice that. Let me make that a little bigger so everybody can see me coming and, and acknowledge me and see what I'm doing. They sound a trumpet. You know, if they give alms, they have to sound a trumpet. And I don't think Jesus was exaggerating. I think they literally did that. They would have somebody sound a trumpet before they gave alms to the poor. Can you imagine watching somebody honestly do that? I mean, how could any, any honest person just see that and not go, what a pretentious jerk? But that goes on all the time in society, doesn't it? You hear it all the time in the news. Some actor, some musician, they give millions to something and they make sure everybody knows about it. You know, if they were sincere, they would just do it anonymously. And there are people that do do that. <laughs> it says in verse 6, and they love the, up, uh, the utmost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the market to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not called Rabbi, for one is your master. You know, so we see the insincere people, you know, they, they serve God because they just want to be seen of men. They're not doing it genuinely. They have the wrong motives. Whereas, by contrast, people who do want to serve God sincerely they don't mind going unnoticed. They don't mind. Look at verse 11. He said, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall, be exalt, shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble, himself, humble himself shall be exalted. You know, sincere people, if you would, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. They don't mind going unnoticed. They don't mind if, if they're not, you know, if they're, if they're uh, no one's going to see their Instagram post. They might not even have an Instagram account. Look, if you have an Instagram account, I'm not against you. <laughs> have one. Go ahead and post on it. It's fun. Right? <coughs> but make sure you're serving God to be seen of God because you love the Lord and not to just be seen of men so everybody knows what a great soul winner I am. Or whatever, you know, whatever area. That's just one, that's one example we use quite often around here, soul winning. But sincere people, you know, they don't mind going unnoticed. And here's, here's, here's the thing. Sincere people, they're going to have their moment in the sun. It's just not the sun you're thinking of. 
You know, we've probably all heard that expression, you know, you got to have your moment in the sun, your moment in the spotlight, your 15 minutes of fame where someone's going to acknowledge you and praise you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who will bring uh, to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. I think there's going to be a lot of people that we, we, maybe we lift up and think, wow, this person is just on fire for the Lord. They do so many great works. And we all know it because they're all over the internet or they're constantly reminding us of all the great works that they do. And we just think, wow, what a great Christian. But there's going to come a day when God is going to make manifest the counsels of the heart. He's going to show the motive behind that work. And then it says this, and then shall every man have praise of God. I mean, whose praise would you rather have? The praise of the world, the praise of, you know, the, the thumbs up. I'd rather have, I would, how many likes is this video going to get? That's my concern, right? What is it on Instagram? Is it a heart? Yeah. How many hearts can my Instagram post? How many loves can my soul winning picture get on Instagram? Right? How many, how many times can people share my video or whatever? How many times is my name going to be mentioned? <coughs> That's the wrong motive. Is that what we want? Or we'd rather have praise of God. Go over to Titus chapter 2. Look, there's, we're all going to have our moment, here's the play on words, in the sun, S-O-N. And when I want my moment in the sun to be, when, before the Son of God. You know, if we're serving God sincerely, that's our moment, the moment in the sun that we desire. That's the spotlight we want where God's shining on it. And showing, you know, the motives behind our works. I mean, are you really going to regret going unnoticed by the world when you hear God, the Lord Jesus, say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant? I mean, if, I, if, if me serving God my whole life and I never, and nobody ever acknowledged me, nobody ever said good job, nobody ever, you know, promoted our ministry or whatever, whatever, if we just go completely unnoticed down here, by others. Is that really going to matter if when we get to heaven, God says, well done, faithful word, Tucson. Is that really going to matter to you in your life if, if nobody ever acknowledges you just go through life serving God in simplicity and sincerity? You know, you're never going to be in the spotlight, but you're going to hear God tell you, well done. Look, I don't know what else can compare to that. I mean, what, what worldly praise can even come close to the praise of God? Nothing. There's nothing out there. There's no walk of fame that I'm going to stick my hands in <laughs> in place of the praise of God. You know, you can have your stupid Hollywood Boulevard or whatever, you know. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the praise I want. That's the well done I want to hear is the praise of God. And if we're going to do that, if you want that, if, if that's what you want in your life, then you're going to have to just learn to serve God simplici with simplicity and sincerity. Just do things the way God wants them done. Don't worry about the results. As long as you're doing it God's way, He's pleased. He'll say, well done. And don't get caught up in trying to impress man or impress others. <clears throat> if we're going to serve the Lord sincerely, we're going to have to take it seriously. And this is my last point this morning. You know, there's no aspect of this ministry that's a game. This is serious business that we're involved in. Now, are we launching people, you know, to the, I mean, P SpaceX just put people in space yesterday. Men have, you know, maybe this, maybe this will cost a rift. Men have walked on the moon, right? We can debate that later, right? I mean, mankind has achieved these lofty, you know, achievements. They've done these great works. And in the world, at least, you know, if we were to compare, in, the, in terms of the world, we compare what we're doing, the world would, would laugh. You guys are going out and bugging people, <laughs> knocking doors. You're spending corona. Are you even wearing a mask? You know, people, they would, they would make a mockery of this. But let me tell you something. In God's eyes, this is serious business. This is the most important work that anyone can be involved in. Now, is it the most important people in the world doing it? In the terms, of, as the world is concerned? No. I mean, who are any of us? Who is sufficient for these things? None of us. But our sufficiency is of Christ. And God, we know God uses the weak things of this world to confound the things which are strong. He uses the foolish things to confound the things which are wise. It's our honor to be used that way.
But here's the thing. If you want to serve God with sincerity, you have to take this seriously and understand that this isn't a game, that this is life and death. This is heaven and hell, literally, for people. <clears throat> you know, it's not a hobby. Soul winning isn't just a hobby here. It's serious business. That's why we do it. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 6. Did I have you go there? It says in verse 6, Young men likewise to be sober-minded. Of course, that's referring to the fact that you shouldn't be, you know, taking anything that would impair your cognitive processes, right? You shouldn't be you know, smoking pot, and taking drugs, or drinking alcohol. You shouldn't be doing these things. That's, that's one sense of being sober-minded. But it also sober, also another meaning of that word is to be serious, to be a sober person, to be a sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. Gravity, that's another sincerity. He says gravity, sincerity, being sober. Taking the work of God seriously. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. Look, if we're going to serve God sincerely this morning, we're going to have to be sober-minded about it. We're going to have to be grave about it. Because <clears throat> it's serious work. And lastly this, serving the Lord sincerely is done out of love and not of duty. If you would, go to Ephesians chapter 6. You say, well, I don't, I don't feel like, I mean, I'm here, I, 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 I serve, but it doesn't feel sincere to me. Well, are you doing, what are you doing in it? Are you doing it out of just duty? Or are you doing it because you love the Lord? If you're going to serve God sincerely, I mean, I don't care how serious you are. I don't care. Maybe you don't even have any social media. No one's ever going to you know, mention you. you. You understand you're fine with all that. But if you're not doing it out of a place of love, you're not doing it sincerely. I'm doing exactly the way God wants it done. I'm out two by two. I'm knocking the doors. I'm not you know, trying to be get my name out there as some big shot. I'm not doing any of that. But if you're not doing it out of love, you're falling short. <clears throat> Look at Ephesians chapter 6. He says this in verse 23. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you, be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. You know, we want to love God and serve God in sincerity. And if we'll do that, you know, God, grace will be with us. God will help us. God will help, you know, give us grace. <clears throat> You know, if we love God, if we're going to serve Him sincerely this morning, you know, the God that saved us, the Lord that came here and bled and died to save our souls, if we're going to serve Him, we're going to sincerely this morning, we're going to do it out of love and for no other reason. Why do you serve God this morning? Is it because you love Him? If it's because you love Him, then you can say that, I, that you're serving God sincerely. <clears throat> that's the one reason we should serve God. And if we would just learn to love the Lord and just serve Him with as that, as our own only driving force behind us. I serve God because I love Him. You know, all these other things will just fall into place. I love the Lord. I want to serve Him. How does He want it done? Just tell me I'll do it. Just, just show me in the book how God wants to be served. I don't care how He, how he tells me to do it. I'm, that's how I'm going to do it. Why? Because I love Him. <clears throat> that's how you'll know you'll be serving God sincerely this morning when you're doing it for that reason alone because you love him who loved you let's go ahead and pray